Okay, so we got uh, units out of the way. Let's actually start talking about how we play uh, Last Blitzkrieg. So uh, here's a super high zoom view of the map. Zoom in a bit. This is the actual map portion that we're playing. So the turn sequence. I got my rules in front of me and the turn sequence is reinforcements and weather, assignment, first player determination, activation. All right, so reinforcements and weather is uh, more or less a administration kind of thing to deal with. Um, each turn, depending upon the scenario, uh, you'll get new units coming in from off board. That's nothing terribly radical. And weather is, uh, depending upon how you choose to play it, can be randomized via the dice, or you can just play historically, right? And you get the weather that the combatants got. Assignment is nothing more than... Uh, Do we even have any in this scenario? So, in a few rare cases, there are units which are not actually part of a formation and they can be assigned to a formation. This is a phase where in which you can reassign them to a different formation. I don't believe in this scenario, and we're playing the Conf Group Piper scenario. Um, this is scenario... Five. Uh, check here. Yes, five point five. I don't believe um, there are a bunch or many units to be reassigned in this phase. Also, um, in this uh, game scenario, game. Uh, so in in the last Blitzkrieg, um, the U.S has air points, which for most cases work a lot like artillery points. Um, the Germans have no air points. Uh, the Luftwaffe is pretty much hammered and ineffective in this game. Um, there are other games in the series, battalion combat series. Um, I don't actually know if the Luftwaffe is active or not in them. I, I only have Last Blitzkrieg, and so that's what I'm playing. And so perhaps there are German air points. Um, it, but in this game, the Germans have zero air points throughout the entire scenario, no matter which one you play. And so that's, uh, that's that. So then uh, you have your first player determination, and I guess a random die roll in most cases would determine who the first player is uh, but most scenarios actually define who the first player is so if we're playing Conf Group Piper scenario 5 that is defined as the German player and so the Germans go first and so now we go into the activation phase and this is really where the game happens um, in not so many words uh, as we discussed previously, you have formations, or divisions, if you will. Uh, and so in the activation phase, uh, a player will choose to attempt to activate a formation. And depending upon his success, he will then be able to perhaps... Uh, move and use the formation's units. Um, so let's work through one of those. This is more or less the core of the game. And uh, this is this is kind of where the magic begins to happen about this system. Um, and let's uh, let's explore and talk through why. So if I pull up the activation table, um, 
It's known as a snafu roll. Um, so your snafu roll results are a fail, a partial, or a pass. Um, what you want is a pass. Uh, a partial is somewhat acceptable. A fail is, uh, for the most part, uh, the formation won't be able to do anything. Um, but let's, uh, let's continue. So, if, uh, we're going to assume that I'm the German player, let us, let's assume that, and, uh, my first activation will be Conf Group Piper. Right? Why not? So, if I pull up the chart... If I lost it, there we go. Oops, not that one, this one. Okay, so there's numerous modifiers to this uh, snafu roll, or your activation roll. And this is, uh, this is where the game system becomes, it's a big part of the shine of the game system, if you will. Um, a lot of the abstractions around supply and uh, line of command and various uh, divisional uh, fatigue and things of this nature come into play here. And so, um, in not so many words, right, uh, a, a cut-off tired division will probably fail their snafu roll and end up with a fail and more or less be able unable or yeah unable to do anything and so um, fresh or un uh, right non-tired divisions that are in command and control that have supply lines will probably pass on their snafu roll and thereby be able to do anything and everything, right? That that's possible in the game, and so um, it's um, I don't know if it's a weird concept. It makes perfect sense to me, but it might be a new concept um, that you'll end up with an entire formation which could fail its snafu roll and kind of sit here and do nothing. And this is really a kind of on the player, or the commander, if you will, as a determinant of what he did with the formation on the previous turn. Uh, a lot of these modifiers are the result of player action and not uh, historical stuff. So, um, I guess... Real quick in closing, if you manage your formations well and are a competent uh, commander, then you can minimize these uh, negatives and your formations will be active and passed on their snafu rolls and then you're capable of doing things on the battlefield. If you botch um, kind of the uh, operational aspects of moving these formations around, you're going to get penalized. And that's, uh, that's the way the system works. That's a definite abstraction. On the other hand, it, to my mind at least, it makes perfect sense. And so let's, uh, let's dig in here. I don't believe you're able to see this pop-up. But I'm pulling up the snafu table. And if we're going to fire up uh, Conf Group Piper, right? So so we do this on a formation basis. So a formation chooses to activate. So if we choose to activate Conf Group Piper, there's his HQ. Right? So we're supposed to flip that. And he's now considered to have been activated. Uh, 
he has a command range of five as you can see uh, all of his uh, constituents are within his command range so that makes things good and useful uh, if we pull up the snafu table there's a list of modifiers um, the first modifier is uh, actually the fatigue level of the unit um, I believe yeah conf group Piper has a he's fresh so fresh you actually get a plus one to the die coordination marker so you get uh, a coordination marker pretty much if you march through another formations uh, uh, how do you call it in the rules it's called a blob but I mean pretty much it, it boils down to if one formation marches through another formation they both get a coordination marker um, that marker lasts until they make a snafu roll making a snafu roll removes the coordination marker um, but it does result in a minus one to your snafu roll so we get the plus one for fresh the minus one for the coordination marker uh, mixed formations is the next one there's a minus one for that so if the formation in question is uh, scrambled up with another formation then there would be a minus one um, to the best of my knowledge conf group Piper is actually not mixed they're just strung out along this road here and uh, they are within this blob in and of themselves and so they're not mixed at least that's the way I read the rules I'm open to being corrected or schooled on such a thing um, then there's a game specific snafu DRM so for December 16th through 18th the Germans get a plus one um, the Americans for example December 16th to 17th get like a minus two this is sort of a an overarching at the beginning of the campaign the Germans are uh, well supplied um, they have surprise and their benefit and uh, and yeah so they get a little bump on their snafus the US gets a, a minus on their snafu okay next there's this entire subsection if combat trains are legal so combat trains being legal what does that mean so the idea here is you have an HQ you have a combat train the uh, legal if a combat train is legal uh, the HQ can trace a route to the combat train along roads and it's between 5 and uh, 15 5 and 10 or 5 and 15 hexes um, and then the combat train itself can trace a route uh, off the map right so he goes off the map and that's uh, that's where the bullets and the bombs and the spam are flowing in and conf group Piper troopers are happy and fed and 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 all is well right and so uh, that's a legal combat train um, so you get a plus one if it's the optimal distance and yeah it says right here at least five hexes no more than 15 hexes C rule 10.3 C so uh, that is the case here and so we have a plus one now um, the next modifier is a minus one for ghost trains so uh, at the start of this scenario the conf group Piper supply train is actually in ghost mode and uh, the basic concept and idea here is um, right one doesn't just uh, willy-nilly put supply trains in place they take time to establish and develop and so um, 
this is one day into the campaign, and I believe Conf Group Piper is already blitzed forward, and therefore its supply train, because it moved, and that's more or less what what makes a supply train go into ghost mode if it moves. Um, the Conf Group Piper blitzed up here, and it moved. And so its supply train followed it, moved, and went into ghost mode. So um, the snafu roll is therefore modified by minus one, canceling out the plus one for the optimal distance. So there's a minus one for what's called crossing the streams. So crossing the streams, as I understand it, um, is multiple HQs using the same road network to the edge of the board to draw their supply. Um, as you can see here, right, you got the 12th Volks Grenadier, the 3rd Falschman Jagger uh, Division, the 1st SS Panzer, I think is somewhere scrambled in here, I'm not even sure where their uh, supply train is, and Conf Group Piker, Piper, right, and so they're all sort of utilizing this road through, uh, uh, don't hate me for this pronunciation, Stad, Stadkiel, and then through Junkwuth, and, uh, right, so they're all drawing supply through the same area, and so that's uh, a pretty textbook example of crossing the streams. So we're going to suffer that minus one. And then the last modifier here is a minus one if the uh, MSR, which is main supply route, that's an acronym uh, used often in the rules, uh, uses tracks. What is a track? Um, a track is what I referred to earlier. It's these uh, lousy roads, if you will. They're sort of the uh, weakest of the weak roads. Um, I do not believe that applies in this case because, right, so here's our uh, our supply train. So if we, uh, whoops, if we remove the units from the map, all right, we can trace our supply across these primary and whatever, real roads. Um, I don't think we have to use tracks anywhere. So uh, in that sense, we're okay. So uh, now the question is, what was the total? So we refresh. We have coordination, so that cancels out. We're not mixed. We get a plus one for game-specific because it's early in the campaign. And we got a minus one for ghost and a minus one for stream. So I think our total is a minus one. Okay. So uh, Vassal being the impartial arbiter of all things, we can roll two dice six. And, and you might be thinking, and I would agree with you, um, this is actually a, a pretty important die roll. Um, so if Conf Group Piper gets to fully activate and do everything it wants to do, we're going to have a game here. Um, if Conf Group Piper fails its activation and can do little or nothing, um, it's it, right. It's almost a dead in the water sort of situation. Um, as I discussed in my previous. Uh, overview if you look at the Germans for this scenario right there's the 326 Volks Grenadier and these guys are not particularly uh, efficient and they're up against um, Americans who are in prepared defense with support in towns in defense um, this this division, the 326, is not going to push very far, very fast, if at all. Um, and again, if we look at the 277th, um, 
you got Americans in the woods prepared, right? So they're entrenched. They got terrain. Um, the 277th isn't going to push into these guys particularly fast or easily. And even the 12th SS Panzer Division, which is a capable unit, is not going to be able to at least quickly smash these uh, Americans out of the way. That's just not going to happen. And so, uh, uh, right, and so if you if we step back for a moment and think about the scenario victory conditions, right, there's these uh, victory hexes. And I'm not ex I'm not even 100% sure of what the victory conditions are, but in not so many words, the Germans want to capture as many of these as they can, and they got five turns to do it. Um, as we discussed in the last overview, yes, in one turn, theoretically, a German could move from here to there, but now we've got these uh, pesky Americans in the way. And so... Um, that throws a bit of a problem, right? So, now, if we want to talk about the 12th Volksgrenadier, probably the most capable Volksgrenadier division here in the scenario, with their fours. So, again, you have Americans, <laughs> and again, it's the 99th Infantry Division. They're entrenched. They're in the woods. They have terrain. Um, the 12th Volks Grenadier can probably push these guys out. Um, historically, that was the German plan, right? The The German plan was to have these uh, Volks Grenadier divisions punch holes in the line. And the Panzer divisions were supposed to just then run roughshod. Um, this is a day into the campaign. This is the 17th of December. As you can see, for the most part, these Volksgrenadier div divisions have not done uh, their job, if you will. Um, they probably were not capable of doing their jobs. Uh, I just would chalk that one off to uh, uh, Hitlerism or what have you. Um, but uh, you'll note here, um, down way at the south part of the, the scenario, we have Conf Group Piper, and Conf Group Piper or Piper, more or less himself recognized rather quickly in the first day, the 16th of December that uh, the 3rd Falschmann Jager Division was not going to punch the hole that he needed and so he basically took his entire Conf Group marched him up the road and hell or high water, he just marched him right through the third Falschermager, and he's now sitting here, ready to rock and roll. Um, and he wants to uh, punch through. That's historically what he did. Um, in front of him is not much. There's this U.S. 14th Cav, which is um, it is an armored division, but it's kind of a light armor division, right? These guys have AVs of one. Um, there's a couple of dual. But step-wise, right, there's two steps, there's one step, and there's three steps. Um, that circle on the three steps and the AR rating for this unit is not something I covered in the last tutorial. This actually means this unit is non-replaceable. Uh, so each turn, each side gets some replacement points, which can restore steps to units. Uh, in not so many words, this unit is not allowed to receive those steps. Um, and so it's non-replaceable. And so, uh, right, so there's a little bit of uh, opposition to Piper, but uh, if if he avoids them, and it he can, right, along this track, which is 
historically exactly what he did. Um, these guys aren't going to do a whole lot to him. Um, at least as he chooses to move. All right, so it's now time to roll the dice. So our total snafu modifier again, all right? Plus one fresh, uh, minus one con coordination, not mixed, plus one for early in the campaign, plus one for optimal distance, minus one for ghost, minus one for crossing the streams. I believe we have a straight roll. So use Vassal's glorious die rolling system and get a 10. So this means that uh, Conf Group Piper is 100% uh, activated, or what is known as a pass. Which means, and this is an important new concept, so when you get a pass, You're allowed, or required, I guess you will, to place objective markers. So with a pass, you get to place two objective markers. All right, so let's drag a couple of them out here. There's two of them. Um, so when a formation activates, it is only allowed to launch... Um, a normal attack within two hexes of an objective marker. And there's other sorts of attacks it can also only do within two hexes of an objective marker. And so the placement of the objective markers uh, somewhat determines what the formation is capable of doing during an activation. You can only place objective markers on enemy units, and they need to be placed within the uh, command range of the HQ of the formation. And so, uh, I do not believe we have a whole lot of choice here. Um, although, let's see, one, one, two, three, four, five. Suppose we could put them one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so we can either put it on the first of the 394th. Um, whoops. The third of the 394th of the 99th Infantry Division, or you can put it on the 32nd uh, Armored Reconnaissance Battalion of the 14th Cav. And we could have, uh, of course, uh, I guess I need to use, <coughs> there we go, All right, could do something like that, split up the objectives and, but, uh, this, this, this idea here of putting two objectives on the same target is, uh, is is a value. This is something in um, battalion combat series parlance known as a double tap or a double double hit or uh, what have you. Um, there's there, there's actually a modifier to this, right? So if you this is called a double objective zone in the combat table modifiers, and so this is a value. And so if you get a, a full pass on your activation and you want to really pound a hex, um, that's what you do. Um, so now uh, we've, we've flipped our HQ, we've placed our objective markers. The next step is to move um, each of the units within the formation and this is uh, I, I, to be honest this is where the magic happens so right I've got a formation and 
What do I got here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight battalions in Conf Group Piper. And each of them needs to move and do what they can do. Um, a couple important restrictions to note here is um, any one hex can only be attacked in normal combat once per an activation. So while I do have eight units, um, if, for example, we were to attack the third of the third 94th here, um, that can only happen once. So, um, all right, I could, for example, move, um, I, I don't know, let's not get too worried about the semantics, but move, um, stacking limits in the game is basically two battalions per hex, period. Uh, these guys say they attack the third of the third, 394th, um, all the rest of the units in the formation are no longer allowed basically to attack um, the three of the third 94th. So whatever the outcome is. Um, this this is uh, kind of the beauty and the magic of the system because you need to um, really sort of figure out uh, what it is you want to do with your formation. What are each of the battalions going to do? Are they going to attack? Are they not? Where are they going to move? Are they not? Um, and then when you start talking about bumping up or getting in, in the middle of other formations, all right, then the whole equation gets much more complicated. And, and so this is I, I I feel this is really where the the game system shines and and so one must manage your divisions formations um, well to succeed the the combat is actually fairly straightforward right so we're gonna take um, the action rating of the attacking unit five. The action rating of the defending unit, three. Uh, there's the chart, right? the combat table modifiers. There's some modifiers. It's pretty straightforward, um, kind of what you would expect. So uh, if you drop some Marty in there, you get pluses. If it's a double objective zone, this double tap business, right, you get pluses. Um if there's an assist, more than one guy attacking, two guys attacking, you get a plus. Um, but you need to roll fairly high on this chart to get uh, a positive result as the attacker. Um, an 11 on two die six. Right, so even if we just take the simple case scenario of our uh, Panzer Grenadiers here, say they were supported by Speeds, hitting the three of the ninety third, third three of the three ninety fourth, right? So uh, the Panzer Grenadiers are five against the Americans are three, so that's a basic plus two to the dice. The double objective is another plus one to the dice, so it's plus three. Um, there's a duel, say so we have speeds involved, so he actually adds a plus one. This is one of the reasons I uh, singled him out, singled out dual units. Um, that's a, an important modifier. Um, an assist is when you have more than one unit, right? So there's a plus one. But the Americans are in prepared defense, so there's a plus one on their side. Uh, they are in a terrain hex, so there's another plus one for them, so 
right? At the end of the day, you're kind of getting in the range where the Germans have a plus two or three, perhaps. Um, on two die six, uh, doable, but certainly not good odds. Um, you know, I would, as as a commander of my uh, Panzer Grenadier Battalion, I would want to know that I have something in the order of a, an 80 to 90 percent chance of victory. I'd kick these Americans out of my way, and I could continue to march down the road. And at the end of the day, right, these SS Panzer Grenadiers have got something like a 50-ish percent chance of pulling it off. And if they get stopped, um, they're, they're going to kind of be stopped dead. And the reason I say this is... Uh, I don't know if you guys see the, but my uh, video driver crashes occasionally. That's wonderful. So, uh, Conf Group Kuiper has another route here where they can sort of cruise up this road and avoid the Americans, and they can get somewhere over in here. Um, So they don't actually even need to attack. Um, but if they don't, then you, you, you're you getting into this scenario where, okay, so Conf Group Piper charges through the hole in the lines and they end up over here which is kind of historically what happened right um conf group piper basically charged up here along here took out stavelot the bridge down this way or down that way was blown and so piper went back up along here Leglis and stumont and um, that took him a few days. I think it was December 19th before he was kind of in that area. And the U.S. player gets reinforcements that come in from here and they come down. And they basically stop him. Um, historically, actually, he got cut off. Um he had something in the order of 400 or 300 armored vehicles. Um, by standards, the Conf Group, Conf Group Piper, was uh, highly motorized. And he ended up uh, charging forward and kind of didn't get support and backup and had to abandon all of his vehicles. He ran out of gas. He uh, got his boys back, his, his troops. They sort of marched back by foot to the German lines um, for the most part, but left behind uh, right half a division's worth or a division's worth of motorization and, and uh, to a larger point... Um, the German plan had been uh, they were going to drive across here and punch up across this uh, the Meuse River on Antwerp. Um, Conf Group Piper, the first SS, they were supposed to sort of punch right through here. And the idea, I think, uh, was they were going to be like here on day one or two. Um, this scenario begins on day one. You can see where uh, Piper and his boys are and how much ground they got to cover. I mean, it's not undoable if there were no Americans in the way. But uh, those Americans are in the way, and so that's why you have a game. Um, so that's uh, kind of the basics of an activation. 
our next tutorial will actually do an activation. Okay? So have a good one.